just for a moment before you make your way back to your seats, why don't we slip our hands into the air all across this place? Why don't you lift your voice with your hands and begin to thank Him again that you get to be here today. Come on, it's not a time to be looking around. It's a time to be thanking the Lord. Every day, Lord, that I get to wake up and serve you is a great day. Every opportunity I get to come into the presence of God uh, is a great opportunity. I don't want to waste one moment. I don't want to waste one minute. I don't want to waste one second, Lord. Uh, I want to give you everything that I have. I give you everything that I am, Lord. I surrender myself to you, Jesus. You are my king. I step off the throne of my life, Lord. I want you to sit on the throne of my life. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Go ahead and clap your hands to the Lord as you make your way back to your seats today. I do want to say it is a great honor and a privilege to be standing here. Um, I did not anticipate this. I did not foresee this coming. Um, God has been merciful to me. I give honor to Brother Grant, to the ABI staff. Thank you very much for this opportunity. It's a great privilege to stand here. It's a great privilege to minister the Word of God. You may be seated. I'll share a little bit about myself, and then we'll dive into the Word together. Uh, I am blessed to serve for a few years now as the uh, youth president of South Dakota, and uh, that has been a journey. It's been exciting. Uh, I still have a heartbeat for youth, for seeing young people give their hearts and their minds to the Lord. It's taken me a while to... Uh, grow comfortable with the height of the platform here, so just let me uh, orient for a few minutes. Also, I'm blessed to pastor the Jesus Church in Watertown, and uh, I love y'all, but I'm telling you, there is no greater collection of people than those people at the Jesus Church in Watertown, and so I give honor to my church for allowing me to, to travel and to be a part of this, and I, uh, man, I hope we have a great time here today. But I can't wait to go home. I can't wait to go home. I would be remiss if I did not mention my beautiful wife, Stacy, and my three kids, if they could put up the picture of my family. There it is. All right. I turned around, and I, to my horror, I saw a bald guy standing at the pulpit. And uh, then I realized it was me. <laughs> Pray for me, y'all. It's, uh, it's still terrifying. I'm in the, uh, the gas station, and they have those security cameras, and I'm always like, man, that poor guy is losing all of his hair. <laughs> is there a picture of the back of my head up there right now? Wow, that's dirty. That's dirty. Who's doing that? It's amazing. All right. That's probably better looking than the front of my head, though, so it's all good. Amen. Stacy is an incredible woman. I am blessed by her as she raises our three kids, works part-time, homeschools our oldest daughter, and still manages to keep a prayer life and to be a consecrated woman. Because of Stacy, I get to stand where I'm at. I would not be the, the minister, the man of God that I am without her. Young people, if you find anything in a spouse, find a spouse that loves God and will pray and will sacrifice for the kingdom. Those should be your top priorities, your absolute top priorities. Of course, my three beautiful kids, Tegan is six, Finley is almost five, and uh, our daughter, Emmy, uh, my wife is holding our youngest. She will be two in December, and so God has blessed us greatly. Uh, it is, again, a privilege to be at Torch. I haven't been to every torch over the years, but I've been to some, and they've been special to me. Uh, it was in 2015, uh, 
when Brother Howell was here. Uh, and my wife and I came to Torch at a very low point in our life. And I, I still remember it. We sat about yay far back, about 10, 11 rows back in the middle aisle. And uh, during the altar call, we were just praising the Lord, having a time together. And Brother Howell came and prayed over us. And God just reassured and settled some things. We had, we had just faced another miscarriage. And uh, we're facing the prospect of never having kids. And the word of God just went forth in our life. And we held on to a promise. And God, God has blessed us because of that. I'll never forget that moment at Torch. I believe it was, it was 2015. Amen. Maybe that didn't mean anything to you, but it meant something to me. Who's ready for the word? Amen. I feel hunger in this place today. I feel a desire to do something for the kingdom of God. Anything. Just let me do something. If that's you, would you slip a hand up in this place? I kind of want to know who, my, who I'm talking to today. I feel more to teach than to preach today. So if you came expecting somebody to swing from the rafters and slobber on himself and bang into walls, then you can come to the breakout session later. But, but I feel to teach today if that would be all right. We are at a Bible college after all. I don't place myself on the plane of the same Bible college teachers, but... I feel strongly that God, God wants something to go forth. And at the close of this service, I have a, I have a picture, I have a, an understanding, I believe, that God wants to place something down inside the heart of this generation that is going to change their world. So let's go to Luke chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 18. Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 18. We're also going to read from Ephesians chapter 2 and Romans chapter 1. If it's your custom, you may stand for the reading of the word. Jesus takes the scroll and he declares, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed it. He gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 5. Paul declares that even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together. Everybody say together. And has made us sit together. Say together. In heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Man, it's the best seat in the house. Heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That reserve section over there, that ain't got nothing. On heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come. He might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. God's just given us a little taste of the amazing grace he's going to shower on us. The exceeding riches he's going to pour out on us. And Paul writes this truth today. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast one more portion of scripture we're going to pray Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 says for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek 
This gospel was not reserved for one socioeconomic class, one people, one culture, or one custom, but it is the power of God for salvation to anyone who will believe it. I want to teach this morning on this simple thought. The gospel still works. The gospel still works. Would you set your Bibles aside? And one more time, would you lift your hands? Would you lift your voice? And I believe that even though the room may not be full, uh, there can be a thunderous sound of worship and praise that begins to fill this house. Uh, come on, young people of the Midwest. Uh, go ahead and lift your voice right now. Uh, fill this place with a sound of hunger. Fill this place with a sound of thirst. Uh, in the name of Jesus, uh, let your power move in this house. In Jesus. Come on, one more time before we seat it. Uh, why doesn't somebody shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph? Uh, you're not defeated. You're not a beggar. You're the son and the daughter of God. Uh, so just lift your head uh, and lift your voice. Uh, man, you may be seated feels good in the house today. It's rare to find something 2,000 years old that still works. My body's made it to about 34, and, well, you saw the back of my head. It's starting to go. I've got a pair of AirPods from 2018 that keep hanging on. That's pretty impressive. But somebody recently blessed me with some pros, and so I don't use them anymore. I drove here in a 2010 Toyota Highlander. It's got 159,000 miles on it, and that keeps ticking, and I'm hoping to get another 100,000 out of it. I bought a mug from the flea market in town not long after we moved to Watertown, and you'd think it was really cool. It was a, a, a Posties mug, like a cereal brand. I don't, that's probably way too old for many people here, but uh, it was, it, it had like a dome shape to it and then a little funnel at the top. It was an incredible mug. I loved it. And you would think that a ceramic coffee mug would have a long lifespan. But one day, about a year after I got it, I'm filling up this mug with coffee and I'm holding on to the handle and it shatters in my hand. There's scalding hot, delicious brown water flowing everywhere now. And I, I wept tears, not for the burns on my hand, but for the fact that there was now coffee on the floor that should have been in my stomach. It was a tragedy. I've got a dog named Rocco. I think they have a picture of him. Hopefully they have a picture of him. I'm scared to look because it's going to be the back of my head again. There he is. That's my dog named Rocco. He's 12 and a half now. And let me tell you, the dude barely works. Like, there are, there are very few organ systems on this dog that are still functional. After 12 and a half years, that's it. He eats, he sleeps. And so to encourage him to sleep, we, uh, like the big sleep, we went ahead and bought a puppy. And uh, poor Rocco, his life has been forever changed. Because now he eats, he runs and hides from the puppy, and he sleeps. And then he runs and hides from the puppy to get away. But he is 12 and a half and he barely works. It's, it's rare that there would be a concept or an idea to last unchanged for even a hundred years in human history. Think just for an example of all of the knowledge that the medical world has changed over the last 100 years. 100 years ago, there was still the practice or maybe 200 years ago, they were still practicing bloodletting. Where they would open a vessel in your arm or on your leg and bleed out the, quote, bad blood as a, an attempt to heal sickness. 
Barely or a little over 100 years ago, the first sustained powered air flight took place. And now we think nothing of stepping onto an airplane and popping in those AirPods from 2018 and just catapulting across the sky until we arrive at our destination. A thousand years ago, many were convinced that the world was flat or square. Still, there are some hanging on today that think the world is flat. The Lord can deliver you, I promise. They were scared that it was possible to sail right off and over the edge of the earth. Now, it sounds foolish to us, yes, because we've gained understanding and we've grown in knowledge over the course of time since Columbus proved that it was indeed possible to sail to a new world without falling off the earth. But there is something that's over 2,000 years old, and I'm here today to simply declare it still works. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news still works. We doing all right? Awesome. This is the good part. I don't know if you're waiting for the good part. We're talking about the word. That got somebody. <laughs> My Lord, it's all right to laugh. I believe God's going to move in just the next few moments. Mm. First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. We're going to go through some scriptures here. It says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein ye stand. If you're sitting in this place today and you're thinking, man, why is he preaching about the gospel at an apostolic convention where all of these kids are coming? We've heard this before. Of course you have. That's why you're here. And it never hurts to be reminded of the power that we possess in the gospel. We should never... Never take for granted the fact that we have access to this revelation of what God made available to us. Brother Booker preached last night. It was such a confirmation in the Holy Ghost for what I felt. He was telling you to take your sword out. The problem is many of us might have a little dull edge on that sword. But today we're going to put an edge back on that sword. And we're going to gain some skill with the word of God. So he says, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you've received, and wherein ye stand. By the which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you've believed in vain. It was not just a one-time experience a long ago. Uh, it is something that needs to be new and fresh in your life every day. So Paul says, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and how that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. There it was, right there. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the good news. And 2,000 years later, in 2022, as we sit here in Minnesota, as we've come from the surrounding states, it still works just as good as it did 2,000 years ago. It has not lost its effectiveness. It has not become stale, dry, dead, or boring. It does not matter what our culture believes. It matters only what the Word of God says because the gospel has not changed. The gospel was what transformed Peter and the eleven. It transformed 120 people in an upper room. It transformed Paul to a murderer, from a murderer to an apostle. The gospel worked for my grandfather at the age of 43 to be delivered from alcoholism uh, and live after God until the age of 87. Uh, for my grandmother who smoked like a chimney uh, but is still living for God in spite of difficult circumstances delivered uh, from nicotine. God uh, took a broken marriage and put them back together. They lived longer together in the gospel uh, than they lived 
lived in sin. Uh, it saved my 19-year-old mother uh, who was running from God, but the gospel found her on a church pew one day in Grand Forks, North Dakota. It saved my father uh, who was in pain and running from a divorce uh, that his parents put him through when he was in high school. And every substance he could get in his body, uh, he just put in his body. Uh, but one day, uh, the gospel was preached unto him. Uh, and that gospel that worked back in the 1970s uh, and the 1980s to save my parents, uh, it still works today. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6, Paul writes and says, So as ye therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. It's important that it's not just an experience at Torch. It's important that it's not just something your pastor preaches. It's important that it's not just something your Bible college teacher instructs you and then you go home and forget it. But at some point along the line, you have to grab this truth. You have to take hold of it. Uh, and you need to put down some roots uh, and begin to build your life on the truth of the word. Uh, as you have been taught uh, and learn to abound in it with thanksgiving. Paul cautions them and says, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of this world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of of the Godhead bodily and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power is anybody thankful we'll just pause right there for a second uh, for the revelation uh, that God uh, was manifest in the flesh and dwelt among us uh, and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full uh, of grace and truth uh, I'm so thankful that I get to know the power that is in the name of Jesus. He says, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. He explains it a little more in the next verse. Buried with him in baptism. Uh, if you've never been baptized in the only saving name of Jesus Christ, uh, I'm here to tell you today uh, can be your day. Right now, today, you can go down in the waters of baptism uh, in Jesus' name. Uh, and the Bible declares that every sin, uh, every mistake, every failure, every shortcoming uh, that you've ever had can be washed away in the name of Jesus. He says, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you, everybody say, that's me. Being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him. <laughs> Having forgiven you of all trespasses. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was contrary to us. And which was against us and was contrary to us and took it out of the way and nailed it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Romans calls him the propitiation or the price, the substitutionary sacrifice for our sin. The gospel works. The gospel has power because an innocent Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, surrendered His life in the place of yours. He surrendered Himself, a sinless man, uh, in the place of sinful humanity. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world became my sacrifice of atonement. And he took my sin, which was contrary to me. It fought against everything that God wanted to do in my life. Uh, and he took it out of the way. Uh, and it was nailed with his hands uh, to the cross. Uh, my mistakes, my failures, my mess ups. 
God, uh, the God of the world, uh, allowed himself to be stretched out, uh, hanging naked between heaven and earth, uh, and nailed by his own creation all for you. You see, your sin and my sin required death. Romans 3 and 23 tells us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is not past tense. That is a continuing tense. We are still coming short of the glory of God. But by his grace and the gospel that he made available, God chose to die in my place. It was a sacrifice of atonement. He turned away the wrath of God and satisfied divine justice. We were slaves to sin. Think about yourself before the gospel found you. Slave to sin. Hopelessly entangled. But he came and paid the price for your freedom. He came to be your kinsman redeemer. He came to purchase, as Acts says, uh, the church which he has purchased with his own blood. Uh, it was his blood uh, that was to be spilled to pay the price for sin. And 2,000 years ago, he paid the price for all sin. Your sin is not too big. It is not some special case. It is not something that could not be covered by the blood of God. He paid the price for all sin, uh, everything, anything you could think of or name, uh, he paid the price for you to be delivered from it. We doing all right? All right. I don't want you to forget about the gospel wherein ye stand and by the which ye are saved. It wasn't even a close fight. Colossians says he took him out of the way, nailed him to his cross. He triumphed openly over the devil. It wasn't like a game time decision, fourth quarter, one yard line. It was a blowout. It, it, it wasn't a contest. Listen, the devil is not the opposite of Jesus. He, he's not the counterpart. It's not an equal scale that it's balanced. No, no, my friend. Uh, the blood of Jesus uh, is far more powerful than anything that hell could ever conjure up or anything that hell could ever bring up uh, in your life. I'm thankful. I'm thankful. Though I was raised in the church, I did not always walk in the church. I was a backslidden punk of a teenager, made it into my early 20s before I finally got serious about God. Uh, and all along, the grace of God uh, was reaching for me. All along, the goodness of God. Uh, I've come to talk to somebody today. You're questioning every decision. You're trying to decide whether you want to stay in church uh, or whether you want to pursue something out in the world. Let me tell you, the best decision I ever made uh, was to finally drag this carcass to an altar uh, and tell it to die uh, so that I could live. Uh, I had to tell it to die uh, so that Jesus uh, could live inside of me. We are saved by grace through faith. Paul declares that very plainly in Ephesians chapter 2. But saving faith is more than what many in this mainstream Christianity would have us to believe is just mere mental assent. Saving faith entails an appropriation or a grabbing of it, a bringing it to myself, an obedience element. Saving faith is the acceptance of the gospel of Jesus Christ as the sole means of our salvation, and it's an obedience to that gospel. Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, Paul writes and says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on in him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That's why I'm standing up here doing what I'm doing today. Because today is the day that somebody's going to obey the gospel. How shall they preach except they be sent? 
as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. I am very glad that God thinks my feet are beautiful. Because they ain't beautiful. I smashed a toe last year. It was amazing. I work that into everything that I can. South Dakota kids are shaking their heads at me right now. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For as Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This was not an idea, just Paul's idea. Peter has a very similar idea. Peter, speaking also under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, writes this in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us... What shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? See, there's an obedience element to the gospel. What's the gospel? It's the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it has to be obeyed. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7. Paul writes again and says, You who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now watch this. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You could feel it in the room right there. A realization. If obedience to the gospel is required. And he's coming to punish those that have not obeyed. Then what am I doing with the gospel? What am I doing with this precious truth that's been entrusted to me? With this valuable gem uh, that God has placed down inside of my heart and down uh, inside of my life. Paul writes to the church in Corinthians, it won't be up on your screen, uh, but he says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive uh, in our body the works that we have done. In the next verse he says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. See, this gospel still works. It'll work for every single person in the metroplex of Minneapolis-St. Paul. It'll work for every person in the state of Wisconsin or in Iowa, South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota. The gospel will work. But somebody, somebody has to go and tell them the gospel. Uh, somebody has to lead them to a place uh, where they can respond. Uh, somebody has to bring them to a place of obedience. The gospel is the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it's our faith in the gospel. It's our faith in the word, our saving faith. Given to us by God. Leading us to himself by grace. It unlocks the power of salvation in our lives. But my faith in the gospel is incomplete without obedience to the gospel. So how, how does somebody then respond to the gospel in obedience? I'm so glad you asked. Because I could tell you. In Acts chapter 2. And in verse 37, Peter finishes preaching the first sermon to the first church on the day of Pentecost. Is this too basic? All right. Just making sure. See, sometimes we got to visit that foundation, put some stones in it, double check that it's solid. Before we can build up and launch out to go and do what God wants us to do. They're pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. 
What power in those verses. What power in the word of God. Uh, and it's a promise. It's not just uh, for the 300 odd people gathered here today. It's for the entire Minneapolis Metroplex. It's for your entire high school, your entire middle school, or your entire college. Uh, the promise is for you and for your children. It's for everybody that's afar off. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're rich, if you're poor, if you're black, if you're white, uh, if you're American. If you're Muslim, the promise is for you. <laughs> Obedience to Acts 2.38 is not salvation by works. We either respond to God's offer of grace with faith and obedience or we reject it through unbelief and disobedience. God will not violate your will today or at any point in time. You have to yield and let him work. God's grace offers it. Your faith grabs a hold of it and applies it to your life. So Peter, standing with the, the 11 apostles, he uses the keys to the kingdom to open the door to salvation. It's all the accept statements of Jesus in one verse. In Luke, Jesus said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. In John chapter 3, in verse 3 and verse 5, Jesus said, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he will not enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, if you've accepted the Lord into your heart to be your Savior, uh, I celebrate with you, I rejoice with you, uh, but I've got to tell you, my friend, uh, there's something a little bit more for you today, uh, and it's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Uh, and it's having your sins washed away. I don't demean uh, and I don't belittle anybody uh, who has a sincere relationship and a sincere hunger with Jesus. Uh, but like Aquila and Priscilla coming alongside Apollos, uh, you've got to come up with your word uh, that you've hidden in your heart uh, and you've got to begin to expound that word to them a little more perfectly uh, because there's somebody out there uh, who's looking for more. They're walking in the truth that they they have, uh, but they're looking for somebody to teach them the gospel. They're looking uh, for somebody to tell them about Jesus. After all, somebody told you, and here you sit. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house right now. He is here. Why don't we pause for a moment? Let's just lift our hands all across this place. Uh, go ahead and lift your hands across this house, young people. It's all right. Uh, we know where we're going. God's going to take us somewhere in just a little bit. Uh, we're just going to divide some scriptures for a little while. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3 says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You can leave this place today in a new life, a new creature, old things being passed away, all things becoming new. That means the crack addict who wanders into your church service on a Sunday uh, and he stinks a little bit uh, and everybody slides away from him on the pew. Uh, that means that the very same obedience to the gospel can render him uh, as justified and in right standing with God uh, as God calls him towards a continuing sanctification. Uh, but the gospel works for them too. And so in Acts chapter 8, we see Philip go down to Samaria. He preaches 
the gospel to them. It is received with joy. There is great healing in the city. Demonic forces are cast out. There's celebration. There's everything going on. They're baptized in the name uh, of Jesus Christ. Peter and John come down. Uh, they realize there's still something missing uh, because without the infilling of the Holy Ghost, we're missing out on the life-giving water uh, that Jesus promised. And so they lay hands on them uh, and they receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 10, uh, now we're on the other side of the tracks, as it were. Uh, this is a group of people that the early church still, at this point, probably 10 years after the day of Pentecost, still would not go to eat with them. Uh, Peter required a divine vision uh, to go to this sect of his city and population to tell them about the gospel. Uh, let me just remind uh, the apostolic church here in the upper Midwest, uh, there are are no socioeconomic dividers. Uh, there is no place for racism. Uh, there is no place for any sort of ism uh, that would stop you from telling somebody about the only saving name of Jesus. It doesn't matter if they speak your language. Find a way to tell them. Uh, it doesn't matter if they eat your food. Uh, find a way to tell them. Uh, it doesn't matter if they look like you or not. Find a way to tell them. Acts 10 tells us Cornelius was a devout man. He feared God with all his house. He gave alms to the poor and he prayed to God always. Later in the chapter you find out he was a man of fasting and a man of worship. But he was not saved. And we are surrounded by many. Do not doubt their sincerity. Do not doubt their hunger. Do not doubt the level of desire they have for God. Uh, they are devout. Uh, they are sincere. They pray more than some apostolic kids pray. Come on now, how dare we be willing to let somebody that doesn't have a full revelation of the truth be more hungry for the things of God than we are. But he was not saved. And that should put a burden down inside of your heart for your city. And so an angel appears to him and says, send for Peter. Because he'll tell you what you need to do. And Peter comes in and he simply preaches Jesus. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 44 as I hurry to a close today. While Peter yet spake these words. The Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. I like to think we've moved beyond that in 2022 of being astonished that God would fill this group of people with the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. It was the same sign that they had received all the way back in Acts chapter 2. And it's the same initial sign today. When you are filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, God uh, as you yield yourself to Him uh, will begin to flow out of your mouth in a heavenly language that you have never learned uh, and you will be praising God in a language uh, given to you by God. And so Peter takes a look. He says, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Acts chapter 19 and verse 1. I know you've heard this before. But there's a sword in the hand of a generation. And with a blunt sword we can do dangerous things. But if our sword is sharp and we're skillful with the sword uh, and we know how to use it and how to operate it, uh, then we can begin to divide asunder soul and spirit, joint and marrow in the hand uh, of a consecrated apostolic teenager or young adult. Uh, a sharp sword uh, is a powerful tool of God. So Apollos goes to Corinth. Paul goes to the upper coast, comes to Ephesus and he finds disciples they're believers. They're followers. And he says unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. 
Now, why would Paul start out with that question? When's the last time you went to one of your classmates at school and said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? He connects with this group of disciples, and he asks them about the Holy Ghost. We usually ask, well, what church do you go to? What denomination are you? Can I tell you, I think there's a revival in the denominal world of obedience to the gospel. I think the day's coming where whole congregations are going to obey the gospel and be transformed and changed. There's, a, there's an outpouring coming. Mm. We're going to press on. We're going to press on. I believe the reason Paul asks him this as his very first question is because the baptism of the Holy Ghost was still the normative experience for initiation into the, be, together with baptism in water was the normal experience. It was the normative thing for initiation into that new covenant. It was the standard experience. It what was still practice. It wasn't just an Acts 2 experience. It was also an Acts 19 experience. So here's Paul, who was never even at the upper room, by the way. And now he's querying questions about the very same experience that they received in Acts 2 and that Paul received in Acts 9. It was just the expectation of the church that when you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you're going to be baptized in his name. You're going to be filled with his spirit. And so when they say, we haven't even heard about this. So he says, then how were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. And Paul didn't say, oh, you bunch of knuckleheads. You done missed it. No. He lovingly came along beside them and said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which was to come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. It still works. 2,000 years later, it still works. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, as I close. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. I preached and taught everything I just preached and taught to arrive at this verse. And it's verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word. With signs following. Amen. Stacy was 16. She was a Catholic girl. In a Catholic family. When a friend invited her to a simple youth rally. In Wapiton, North Dakota. And for the very first time. She felt the presence of God. She heard the gospel preached. And it was all she needed. She got her Bible out, and began to read it by flashlight. She came up against severe resistance from her family. They forbade her from going to an apostolic church. And so by flashlight at night, while everybody thought she was sleeping, she was studying the scriptures. And God renewed her in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, all alone praying in a bathroom because it was the only private place she was allowed to lock a door. And in a bathroom by herself, God filled and renewed a little Catholic girl with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In 2016, I brought a young man to torch with me. His life 
was really a wreck at that time. It was just the mercy of God that he was able to go. He had been in and out of jail, came from a broken home, uh, and was headed down a wrong path. Uh, but consistency and love from the church coupled together with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, I performed his wedding earlier this month uh, to a godly woman uh, and he's teaching Sunday school and he's growing in God uh, by leaps and bounds because the gospel still works. Another man with an incredible Incredible life story. Ran away from home at the age of 16. Homeless with a girlfriend raising a kid in a car at the age of 16 and 17. Years uh, of running and then years of getting hungry. And he got hungrier and hungrier from God. Uh, and when I finally got to him, he'd already been baptized in the titles of Father, Son, uh, and Holy Ghost. He thought he had it. Uh, but I began to introduce him to a little bit more. Uh, and God peeled back layer after layer of dysfunction. Uh, he was filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Uh, got revelation of the mighty God in Christ. Uh, and now, uh, now, just earlier last month, uh, I got to watch as his son uh, was filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Uh, it was, oh, the dysfunction. Uh, if only I could tell you the hell uh, that they have been through. Uh, but the gospel uh, was taught to them uh, and the gospel uh, was obeyed by them uh, and the gospel is doing a work in their life uh, and now every Sunday uh, his precious little grandbaby uh, walks down in her free, in her little pink or white frilly dress uh, at the age of three to go to the toddler Sunday school class. Why? Uh, because the gospel uh, broke a cycle of dysfunction uh, that had gripped a family uh, and it's changing the story uh, of the next generation that is rising. Uh, it's the power of the gospel. A lady about the age of 50, give or take, in our church, spends much of her life addicted uh, to alcohol and to heroin, uh, broken uh, in pieces. Uh, but God uh, has delivered, uh, and the gospel made the difference. She's so hungry for more of God. Uh, she's bringing everybody that will listen to church. Uh, any given Sunday, there's somebody else on a church pew uh, because the gospel got a hold uh, of her life, uh, and the gospel got a hold of her heart uh, and the power of God reached down into her uh, and now she's telling somebody else let's all stand together as I close just the other week across my dining room table a wonderful well to do couple sat across from me and with all earnestness the wife hits the husband and says We've got to get dipped before we die. Their home is nicer than my home. Their income is higher than my income. Their marriage and their family, healthy. But without the gospel. Without the gospel, they're lost. And they need somebody to tell them. And so God placed me where he placed me so that I could walk across the street and knock on their door and invite them over to my house uh, for a plate of cookies, a cup of coffee, uh, and access to a life-changing word. They haven't done it yet, but I have full confidence that it will be my distinct privilege to take them under the water in the only saving name of Jesus Christ. I have full confidence that I am going to see them filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Why? The gospel still works. But all of this only happened because somebody went. I am beyond tired of service after service conference after conference, fountain of inspiration after inspiration, 
And God speaks so powerfully in these moments as he's doing right now, only for us to go home and wonder why nobody wants this. That is a lie from the pit of hell. They want what you have. A missionary to a Access Challenge nation came through Watertown at one point and told our church this, at some point delay becomes disobedience. How long are we going to sit on the greatest revelation of human history? Or is somebody finally going to go? Now, I'm not calling you to Africa. I'm not calling you to go to, to Asia. If the Lord wants to call you there, that's on him. But could you at least cross the street? Could you at least cross the lunchroom? Could you at least, if Paul was willing to move heaven and earth, he was willing to endure everything that he did, could you at least pick up your Bible in your schoolhouse and say, hi, I'm Jared. What's your name? Because there's a power in the gospel. Here's where I believe the Lord wants us to go in this moment. I've gone longer than I've intended already. But I believe that we're crippled too many times by a fear of rejection. We're crippled by a fear of, what if I say something and they don't do it? What, what, if, I, what if I tell them about Jesus and they laugh at me? Anybody know what I'm talking about? In fact, we could do a fun study right now. Who has those thoughts on a semi-regular basis? Go ahead and look around the room. You aren't the only one. This world is growing ever more bold. And they're growing ever more in your face with their vileness and their wickedness. But our message hasn't changed for 2,000 years. We don't need new understanding or revelation we just need obedience. We just need to get up, put your phone down, turn off the computer, shut off Netflix, and get out of your house and cross the street. So I'm done. I've delivered the word that the Lord has asked me to deliver. But here's what we're going to do. I don't know how long it's going to go. I don't know what's all going to happen. But I want to have an altar call. I apologize if I'm a little too matter of fact for you. But I'm very confident that this is what God wants us to do. If you feel something stirring inside of you today. And you're challenged by the word of God today. And you want to go home. Not with inspiration but with application. I want you to gather as close as you can to the front of this church. Don't worry about who's standing next to you. Don't look around. Don't try to position yourself. Go ahead and just close your eyes once you come down to the front. Just close your eyes when you come down to the front. Church, I love preaching. Please don't misinterpret my spirit right now. We heard great preaching last night. It was so inspirational. I told him after service, it, it, it confirmed this word for me today, and it confirmed some things I've been asking God in my own life. But sometimes what we need is not more preaching. We just need more obedience. And we just need to go. And look what happened. The Lord working with them. And doing what? Confirming the word with signs following. Too many times we won't go because we're scared God's not going to back us up. But when you will just walk in obedience and you'll walk in hunger, God has promised to partner with you. 
I'm going to read one more portion of Scripture, and this is what I believe God wants for this group to leave here today. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 31, it says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. I cannot wait to respond to the preaching of the word tonight. You are not going to out-respond me. You're not going to be more plugged in than I am. I love the preaching of the word. But the best thing we could leave this conference with is a drive to go and boldness from the Lord. But we don't have boldness. Some do. Some do. You can spot them. They're the ones bringing people to church all the time anyways. But reaching the loss is not supposed to be this special class of people like sister so-and-so is a soul winner. No. It's you. You are a disciple maker. If you can make a friend, you can make a disciple. You can teach. You can tell. You can instruct somebody on the gospel. After all, somebody told you. And here you are. If you've never been filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you want to be filled for the very first time today, would you lift your hand in this place? Never been filled with the Holy Ghost. You want to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost for the first time. Go ahead and lift your hands. It is for you today. If you've got a need in your body, you need physical healing in your body or you need healing in your mind, with every eye closed, would you lift a hand across this place today? And if you need boldness in your life, if you want God to baptize you with boldness in this moment, would you slip your hands in the air? There is not shame and there is not condemnation coming from me to you right now. There's an encouragement from the Lord. You can do this. The gospel still works. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this together. First, we're going to repent. Because it's always the first step that we need to take. Before we can ever have boldness, Proverbs says, the wicked flee with no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as lions. So we're going to silence the voice of the enemy tonight that would tell us that because I've messed up in the past, I can't be used and I can't partner with God. That's a lie from hell. All we have to do is come back to a place of repentance and say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I turned from my sin. Uh, and the Bible says that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. So we're going to do that in this place together right now. Let's go ahead and repent all across this house from the oldest to the youngest. Uh, Lord, uh, we come before you today in hunger. Uh, we come before you today in thirst, but we must be right with you. God, I turn, God, from any wickedness, uh, any evil thought, any evil word, uh, any evil deed in my life, God, I turn away from it. Uh, I believe, God, that you are my only hope of salvation. Uh, I believe, God, that you are my Savior. Uh, I turn from my sin. Uh, I turn from my wickedness, Lord. Uh, God, I turn from my wickedness. I turn from my sin, Lord. Hallelujah. I need you, Jesus. I, I don't want to keep going my own direction, Lord. I, I need you. I don't want to go my own way, God. I, I've messed up too many times. I, I'm sorry, Lord. I, but today at Torch, I, on Friday morning, I'm getting back up, Lord. I, and I'm setting my face towards you again. I, I'm going to follow you. I, I'm going to serve you. I, I'm going to live for you, Jesus.
Now here's what we're going to do next. Here's what we're going to do next. We are going to surrender our hearts to God. It's entirely possible for us to come to this moment and hold out on a piece of our heart and not give it to God. But if I want to partner with God, he demands nothing less than all of everything. The greatest decision I ever made is one that I got to make every single day, and that's to follow after God with everything that I am. So all across this place right now, I want us to have a moment where we just examine our hearts, where you look at your own heart. It's important that nobody's looking around right now. This is about you and Jesus Christ. You don't need to be praying with anybody else at this moment. This is a moment where we examine ourselves. We just look inward. Uh, God, is there any piece of Jared uh, that's still unsurrendered? Is there any piece, God, of my heart uh, that you aren't Lord of? Uh, if there is, God, I pray that you would reveal it to me in this moment. Uh, and whatever it is, oh, God's moving on some young people right now. Uh, there are tears beginning to flow right now uh, as God's showing you some pieces and some avenues of your heart. Uh, go ahead and let him be the Lord of it. Uh, go ahead and give it to him. Uh, let him burn it away completely. Let him consume it uh, upon an altar of sacrifice. Uh, just put it on the altar and let God uh, have control of it. Uh. Surrender might mean a different college. Uh, surrender might mean you go to ABI instead. Uh, surrender might mean you don't go to college. Surrender might mean you end up uh, on the mission field. Surrender might mean you don't get to be that doctor uh, you've always dreamed about being. Uh, but surrender means that the face of God uh, is smiling on you. Surrender means uh, that the favor of God uh, is rushing towards you. Uh, I don't want to hurry past this moment uh, because there are hearts that are being prepared prepared uh, for the deposit of boldness uh, that God wants to put in. Uh, what good would it be if God deposited boldness uh, in an unsurrendered heart? Uh, what good would it be if God deposited something uh, down in the heart of somebody that refused to repent uh, and let him be the Lord?
because my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, the Lord says. Uh, my ways are higher than your ways. Uh, even right now, if you're planning on how to share this gospel, uh, unless you surrender and let God uh, place it down inside of you, uh, you're thinking too small. Uh, you're thinking about winning one uh, when God wants you to win one congregation. Uh, you're thinking about reaching one home on your block uh, when God wants you to reach every home uh, on your block. Come on, uh, we're going to be a generation of radical surrender, uh, of radical obedience to the word of God. Uh, go ahead and pray the garden prayer right now. Uh, not my will, Lord, uh, but thy will be done inside of me. Uh, not what I want, God, uh, but what you want. Let that be done. Uh, See, if this is boring to you right now, uh, it's a surefire sign uh, that there's some parts of you that need to be surrendered. Uh, but if you're tapping into the presence of God right now, uh, then you're on the right track. Uh, if you're feeling God draw closer to you, uh, then you're walking down the right path uh, because the God of heaven uh, is attracted uh, to selflessness. Uh, the God of heaven is attracted uh, to your hunger. He's attracted uh, when the sacrifice is left on the altar uh, and he He's able to consume away everything that is not of God. Come on, just for another couple of minutes. Uh, let the depths of your heart cry out to God. Uh, let the depths of your heart cry out to God. Uh, I want you, Lord. Uh, I don't want to read about it in the book of Acts. Uh, I don't want to hear about it overseas. Uh, I want it in my life. Uh, I want it in my life. Uh, I want it now, God. Uh,
I could have everybody's attention. You can stay in the spirit. Just pray very quietly. Stay focused on the things of the Lord. Once we've repented and we've surrendered, we're finally ready for God to deposit inside of us what we need. A boldness to reach this generation. You don't have to convince God to reach your city. He already died for them. He does not need to be convinced. But apparently sometimes we do. But I believe I'm looking at a generation of hungry teenagers and young adults that want to change their world. So here's what we're going to do. In a moment, I'm just going to pray. I'm going to take every last ounce of faith that I have. I'm going to pray it through this microphone. And when I finish with the words in Jesus' name, we are all going to shout hallelujah at the top of our lungs. We're not going to shout at one time. We're going to shout it over and over. And when we, through obedience, just lift up our voices and our hands, those that need filled with the Holy Ghost are going to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Those that need physical healing, if, if you're going to listen, if you're going to sit there like a bump on a log, don't be surprised if you don't feel anything. But if you're going to obey and you're going to step out by faith and believe that God's going to perform his gospel in this place today, then God is going to move into this place in a powerful way. And if you're ready, God is going to deposit down in your heart a boldness to reach your community that you have never had before. Let's all lift our hands in this place. In just a moment. As you begin to shout hallelujah, the next words out of your mouth, uh, I, I'm speaking to a specific individual right now. The next words out of your mouth are going to come out in a heavenly language that you've never learned before. I want you to let that flow as God fills you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost for the very first time. When God heals your body... I want you to rejoice. I want you to, with thanksgiving, begin to dance, to shout, whatever you have room for. When you feel God's healing come into your body, I want you to begin to thank Him and rejoice. And when that boldness comes upon you, we are just going to pray. I want you to picture your city in front of you, uh, and you're praying them all through to the Holy Ghost in this place. Uh, by the power and the authority of the Word, uh, God, all we did was present the Word of God. Uh, we presented the promises of God, uh, and I'm looking at a generation of hungry young teenagers and adults that are thirsty for the presence of God in their lives. Uh, and so, Lord, uh, I ask you uh, what you spoke to me earlier earlier. Uh, would you do it in this place now? Uh, let there be a deposit of boldness. Uh, let there be a deposit uh, of spiritual aggression. Uh, let there be a deposit uh, of a lasting hunger for the word of God uh, and for the spirit of God. Uh, let there be visions uh, and dreams, uh, signs uh, and wonders, uh, thirst uh, for the supernatural, uh, thirst uh, for the gospel to penetrate their community in Jesus' name!